I need to take you again back to Second uh, Kings today, and we are today on the fast track. So if you don't have your track shoes on today, the scripture is just going to really run off and leave you because we are going to screen through the years. All of a sudden, the author, who in some places seems like we just kind of stalled out and we're just following along almost day by day, has suddenly begun to put his foot in the throttle, and we are going through 17 years and 20 years and another sizable chunks of time like they were nothing, with uh, very little detail and just uh, a lot of buzzing quickly through it, so it can get a little confusing. So we'll start uh, with maybe have Kathy pop our map up just so we can remember where we are. So here is the divided kingdom, and this morning we're going to be focusing, we've been in Jerusalem, but we're going to focus back, whoops, I better turn myself on here, there we go. Um, we're going to be back up here in Samaria, in the capital of uh, Israel today as we get into our study, but I do want you to remember what's happened down here in Jerusalem, because we will be back there and there's going to be some linkage between where we are here and, and what's going on down there next week. So hang, well, I think next week. Anyway, so kind of keep that in mind. Jerusalem has had incredible turmoil. And they have had a king who came with great hope when they thought the thread was broken and the promise was going to be gone. And in fact, those, uh, in particular, Athaliah, who were in charge at the time, and I'm sure our enemy himself thought he may have successfully snipped the thread that held the promise of the Savior. And yet that baby was hidden in the temple and reintroduced uh, after six years. And uh, the king was proclaimed and went ahead and started out, remember, doing really well until the high priest died and then everything fell apart. We saw that probably they are enduring right now some severe drought. They're very possibly dealing with a plague of locusts that came through along with that that just has cleaned everything out. Uh, we went back and looked at the prophet Joel, who many scholars believe that occurred right in that uh, period of time. The whole first chapter of Joel is this picturesque description of the locusts that came through like an army and just wiped out uh, the entire crops and everything, they, didn't, they were down so far they didn't even have uh, grain or anything, oil or anything to take in and make their offerings with. The temple was service was, sac was hurting. Uh, the priests were unable to even probably get their daily bread because the sacrifices were being cut off. It was a dire time. And maybe it was those pressures along with some pressures from outside forces militarily and all were starting to to push in and crowd him and somehow his advisors all said, this isn't working. We got to go find us another God that's going to take care of things and he just went way off the deep end again. So we had his uh, rule kind of came to a miserable end as he's ill and uh, gets snuffed out by some of his own people, some of his own, uh, not really advisors, but servants that were supposed to be taking care of him end up ending his life and they take his son and make him king in his place. So that's what's happened down there. Really troublesome times. Struggling times in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, we're going to go back up and catch up a little bit. And the northern tribes are having struggles of their own. And we are making a transition this morning to a new king as the rule of Jehu comes to an end. And you'll remember he came through, really cleaned out the worship of Baal or Baal or however you pronounce that. Uh, really cleaned out that worship in Israel and cleaned out the, the line of Ahab both in the north and southern kingdoms and started out doing what God had said he was going to do. I'm going to clean house here. And because of that, he was promised four generations of his line that would have the chance to rule. However, he still hung on to some of the old worship of the golden calves and some other issues. 
And if Kathy, if you pop up that chart with the kings, maybe we can kind of get a look at where we're at. Just remember, this is the, the Jerusalem side of things, and this is the Samaria side of things. And here's Jehu right here. Uh, it is broken. And here's the line of Ahab coming down here, and all of a sudden it ends right there. And the duck's over. See that little line that starts a new line with no connection up here. That's uh, where we broke the line of the previous king. And now we've started a new line with Jehu. And we'll have one, two, three, four. But we'll come down here and this guy will break that line. So uh, we're, we're starting out with Jehu's. And actually I'm pronouncing his name very Americanized. Because you got to remember that J-E is not pronounced J in Hebrew. Just like it isn't in uh, Spanish and some other languages. It's Ya. So it's Yah, Yah, Yehu, Yahu, or Yaho. Yeah. Yahoo! Yeah, there you go. So when you see that J-E, you think, yeah. And then when you get this Kaz thing, that's that's that rough breathing thing again. So it's Kaz, you know, with that K sound kind of that hard ha thing. So we're going to Yaho, Ahas, or something to that effect. And I'm sure I slaughtered it terribly. <laughs> But anyway, so he just gets you thinking a little bit of the Hebrew. So we'll pick him up today, and we'll be following this line here. And meanwhile, you can see that we've got some really stacked up numbers of kings over here. So it gives you a little hint of what it's going to look like in Jerusalem for the next period of years. As we go through four kings here, uh, you've got a bunch of them over here. So it'll get really interesting. So you're going to need your track shoes on to kind of keep up. This morning. So let's go to chapter 13 of 2 Kings and read through a portion of that passage and see if we can try to sort things out a little bit. So we are now in the 23rd year of Yoash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah. Okay, we're talking about the king that's in Judah. This is where I always get all turned around. He said, in the 23rd year of the king of Judah, we're now having a changeover in the northern kingdom, and Yehoahaz, how do say Yehoahaz, the son of Yahu, became king over Israel at Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. And believe it or not, there's a couple of pages worth of commentary on that, because those years don't all line up and match up nice and pretty, and they have trouble figuring out how you get 17 out of it, but... Trust me, they find a way to make it work. And the way that they label the years, and then and some actually say it may have been 16, not 17. Anyway, there's a big. If you need something to argue about, here's a good passage to do it because it's tough to make years fit. But uh, anyway, we've got. If you mainly get the idea that he's going to reign for a reasonable period of time, and in our way of looking at the world where, you know, if you serve two terms as president of our country for eight years is a long time, this is still a fairly lengthy piece of time to be in control of the nation, but nothing like the 40 years that we've seen with some others. So uh, it's a fair piece of time, but by far not the longest. And during those 17 years, we have verse 2. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And so Jeroboam and Nebat and all this sort of thing. And he made Israel, which he, with which he made Israel sin, and he did not turn from them. And when you read that, you've got to remember, okay, what is that that Jeroboam did that was so terrible? Well, remember, he didn't want people going to Jerusalem because he's afraid he'd lose his nation, they would eventually drift back to the king in Jerusalem, to the southern kingdom of Judah, and he didn't want them doing that. He wanted to keep power himself, so he set up alternative worship sites. And he put golden calves in Bethel, and he put golden calves up north in Dan. Now I have the map back, so you can see that again, get that in your brain a little bit. It's not on there, but Bethel is down on this, close to the border down here, just to head you off before you get to Jerusalem. And Dan is way up north up here, so you get the folks up here have some place convenient to shop. You know, you want a Safeway or a Walmart close by home. Well, this was worship close to home, convenient for you to go to, and so you don't need to go all the way to Jerusalem. 
And this guy has said he's not gone back to the, the worship that Jezebel introduced, but he's staying with that program. And you'll see that all the way through the kings of the north. So he stayed with them, and God wasn't real happy with that. In verse 3, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of this guy, Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of a new person we haven't met yet, Ben-Hadad. Some of you may, from reading before, Ben-Hadad popped, oh, that's a familiar sounding name. Well, he is the son. As we reach him here, he is probably one of his senior military guys, the general on the field, and uh, they have been given into the hand of this guy. And things are tough. So with our map up here, you'll remember, Syria is up this way, Damascus up in the northern part there, and what they are after <coughs> is the peace of Israel that is right in here. You've heard of the land of Gilead, is a little bit kind of further south about in here, and then there's this piece up here. Those were the half-tribe of Manasseh. Let's say Gad, is that right? I'm not certain about the second one. Manasseh was up here. There's another one down here that had these portions on the east side of the river. And he's been, he's, they've come in, taken big chunks out of that. And it looks like some scholars believe they've made some inroads even across the Jordan to the west. But they have really been pushing hard on Israel. And you remember the prophecy when Hazael took over the kingdom was, remember what the prophet saw? It was, it was the crying prophet. Elisha went to him and just started crying, weeping. And he said, why? He said, because I see the, the women and children that are killed and the cities that are burned and all the destruction that will happen in Israel through you. And his reaction was, no kidding me? Wow. <coughs> Things were ruthless when they had war back in those days. Uh, we'll have a chance to see some more of that fun stuff. So here they are. They're pushing really, really hard on this king. And you've got to understand the stress they're under. Uh, I want to skip down to verse 7 because you need to understand what's driving this king in the next verse that I'm going to skip over for a moment. As you look at verse 7, it says, For he left Jehoahaz of the army not more than 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 footmen. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust of threshing. So if you want to get a little bit of an idea of what he gives this little illustration of the dust of threshing. And for those of you who are not farming, I've got a couple of pictures of the Juris Harvest operation this last year. So you get the, the threshing <laughs> floor here. <laughs> These are a, a new, you know, it's not case, but... It's not John Deere either, but there may be some green out there. This is the threshing floor you've all heard about, and we've read about, you know, the threshing floor of Aruna, where the, where the temple is built. Well, here's what it would have looked like, more or less, a hard-packed piece of earth to keep the seeds from penetrating, and so you wouldn't get a lot of stuff. And you take your animals out there, and you drive them around and stir them around, and you just stomp the daylights out of that thing, and then you go to phase two when the wind blows. And you fling it in the air, and it blows the chaff and the dust away. This is the illustration that the writer chose to illustrate what's been happening to Israel. They have been pummeled and pummeled and pummeled by the Syrians. And now they are being blown, their military has just been decimated. So it's just like the dust of threshing. It's gone with the wind. So... It gives you a little bit of sense of what's happening in Israel. Judah may be feeling the pinch down there. These guys are really feeling the pinch as well. The enemy is pounding them hard, and times are tough. And that brings us to this interesting verse 4. In this 17-year period, we're given this little tiny glimpse of this king and the nation at this time. And this Jehoahaz, who we just read about, was evil. In the, did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
And he didn't turn from the golden calves, and yet one day, all of a sudden, out of the blue, Jehoahaz entreated the favor of the Lord. And the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel and how the king of Syria oppressed him. And he gave Israel a deliverer so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians, and the sons of Israel lived in their tents as formerly. And I probably should read the next verse because that will make you even go, I don't get this. Nevertheless, they did not turn away from the sins of the house of Jeroboam with which he had made Israel sin, but walked in them. And the Asherah also remained standing in Samaria. And you go, this doesn't make any sense at all. First, the guy prays and God says, ah. I see my nation Israel, and I'm going to answer him. And so the first challenge is to try and understand what possibly, how could God listen to this guy who is evil, who pursued the sins of Jeroboam, and yet suddenly in this moment entreated and said, you know, maybe I need to remember this guy. And almost, bang, we've got a response from God. Have we ever seen that before? How about Ahab? The guy whose family's just been cut off from everything. Do you remember what happened with him? When he was confronted with the fact that he'd taken Nabal's life and he was going to be judged for that. And God says, I'm going to cut off your whole family. And Ahab tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went, and God says, you know what? I see that. And I am going to make it happen in your son's time and not in yours. Remember that? God, how, God, how can you do that? How can that make sense? When they still, they come there, they plead to him, it gets better, and then they just go right back to what they were doing before. Is there a message in there for us? Just do what you want to do. God will take care of you. Right? And not quite. Because he still left him with 10,000. Because it says 4 in verse 7. He left, that's God, left to him. The small decimated army. He still got judgment. So what is this? Can you spell grace? Are there things happening in our own time, in our own land, in our own world that absolutely have to offend God something terribly? Has He extended grace that we don't deserve? Oh, man. Has He ever done that for us? In that moment when we turn and say, Oh, Lord, I've blown it. First John 1 9, I confess my sin. And he says, I am faithful. I forgive that sin, and my son has paid for it, and it's forgiven. And then we turn right around and go, boom, right back into the old. Yeah, I think, you know, when you read this, you might want to think, well, he's just using God. He's just evoking his name because he wants help here. But, but actually, God knows the heart, and he knows what it's repentant. And so, but that doesn't mean that we don't turn away from it. It's, you know, so... Yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> it might be a stretch to say, oh, this proves he was a saved man. I don't know that it does that. But it does prove that God, and notice it says, why did God listen to him? Because it says, for he saw the oppression of Israel and how the king of Syria oppressed them. Does he care about his people? Yeah. yeah. Does he have a heart for his people, even as they're disobedient? God is yeah. He's, yeah. It's it's you know I don't know if you see the focus or not in this passage, but it's we're so focused on the king and on what's going on with him, and in this verse, all of a sudden the focus gets turned on the character of God and just shines right on him. Did you see that? It's like he turns around and he wants to say, Here's all the mess that's going on in Israel. I want you to see what God is like. And here he is saying, I'm going to extend grace to these guys because I'm looking down on my nation, the people I love, and they're all screwed up and they're under oppression and they're really suffering. 
and I'm going to look out on them in grace, and I'm going to go, I'm going to give you an escape. And we're going to see, it doesn't tell us clearly what that is. In this, he says, I'm going to send Israel a deliverer or a savior. And it says they escaped or they went out from under the hand of the Syrians. They got a reprieve from the Syrians and what they were doing. And there's at least a couple of possibilities of what that is. And one of them is not in the scripture. But if you go into the historical record and look, all of a sudden, remember there's that, if I get the map back up here, way over, here's Syria and Damascus up here, but way over the Fertile Crescent, <laughs> over up north, there's another nation over there in a place called Nineveh, you may have heard. And that nation has had its rise and fall and rise and fall. And then when its strength has come up, one of the things that it has sought out across this fertile present is access to this thing right here called the Mediterranean. Because in access to the Mediterranean, you get access to everything on the northern coast of Africa, all the way Italy, Spain, all that way up there, the trading routes of the Mediterranean. All of a sudden, you're the link from China, India, all those places over there across, and you want those port access, you want that trade route, and they push over this way. Every now and again, when they get some strength, they start pushing back over towards this land. Guess what happens about this time? There's a king in Assyria that comes and decides to pay a visit to the guys in Syria. I know kind of... Those use of those terms kind of throws you a little bit. But they suddenly got pressure on the other side. Kind of like what happened in World War II with Germany. They were over here in Russia and they were over there. And they were, all of a sudden they get heat from somewhere. You've got to shift the troops to try to meet it. And that's what happened. About that time Syria suddenly had deals, problems on the other border that they needed to redistribute some troops to. So that seems to have taken place. And then uh, we will find out that uh, God gave some uh, ability to the next king when jo Jehoahaz slept with his fathers. Uh, let's read on down because there's this other interesting story that we want to take a look at here if we can get to it. And so uh, they're the dust of threshing, and now the rest of the acts of Yahuwahaz and all that he did in his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? In other words, you go read about that. I don't need to tell you here. So you can check it out in your local library, I guess. Uh, and he slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, and Yoash, his son, became king in his place. And in the 37th year of Yoash, king of Judah. Now this gets confusing. you got two kings with the same name. So 37th year of the one in Judah, Jehoash, or Yoash, the son of Jehoahaz, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned 16 years. So dad reigned 17 years. His kid takes over now, and he's going to reign for 16 years. And he was a wonderful guy in verse 11 too. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn away from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which uh, he made Israel sin, but he walked in them. And the assumption is that he led the nation that way. And then there's so much told about him here. Notice this, verse 12. And the rest of the acts of Joash, Joash, and all he did, and his might, with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So he slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on his throne. Boy, that was quick. Did I tell you, you need track shoes 16 years? Just shot by us. But the nice thing about it is they back up the truck just a little bit, and we're going to get to read another little snippet about this guy. And we're also going to get to go over to Chronicles next time and look at the Judah side and that little note about the war he did with the king of Judah is a big deal for Judah. So we'll have to go back and we'll see this Yoash guy again from that side. But right now, for some reason, right in the middle of this, he's dead and gone. And then he says, oh, 
But I want to tell you one last little vignette, one last little story about a guy we're familiar with. This is the last story about this guy that we've been following kind of, it's, it's been a long time. Haven't heard anything from Elisha for a long time. And as we come into this next passage, it's for some reason the writers decide to plug this little story right in there in the midst of all the chaos and all the turmoil and the turning over of kings and the mess we've got up there in Israel. And with Samaria still pushing as Yoash, Yoash, however you pronounce it, is still struggling a little bit. He hasn't seen all the relief yet from Samaria. And word goes out to the palace and says, Elisha is sick. Verse 14, chapter 13, when Elisha became sick with the illness of which he was to die, Yoash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. We've heard that phrase before. We have heard that one before. Anybody remember where it was? Elijah. This is Elisha's very <laughs> words over the prophet Elijah as he's being pulled off in the glorious chariot, taken from the earth, and he cries out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen are in. That is a weird thing to say. And here it is again. And you got to think about what's going on, and I think it'll make a little more sense to you. Here's Joash, somewhere in the middle of his reign, Assyria, Assyria pressing hard on them. They're starting to fight battles up north, but they're still pressing hard. And they have taken, they right now control everything this side of the river. They've got it. And they've driven them out. His troops are diminished. They've had a, a huge setback. And now if that weren't bad enough, the prophet, the one guy that every once in a while would come and bail them out with some prophecy about what invasions were going to happen or something to bail the king out, he's dying. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do now? And Joash goes down there and he comes to him as he's on his deathbed. And he cries over him. The chariots of Israel. What are chariots in those days? That's the high tech, effective military. That's the, what's that, M1, A1, Abrams tank? Or maybe there's a higher level now. This is your super weapon. So the saying about that, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. Oh man, what a tool the horse was. Can you imagine the, the fear of a foot soldier getting run over by horses that are trained for battle? I mean, you, you've seen, have you seen the Lipizzan horses? Aren't those cool? Those beautiful white horses and they do all the prancy stuff. Do you know why they train them up to rear up like that? That's an attack tool. They weren't trained to rear up and look pretty. They are trained to rear up and strike the foot soldier with a horse's hooves. I mean, they come thundering through you, chariots and then these horsemen with these things that they move fast. You could outrun any man. More endurance. Man, this is, this is the blitzkrieg of their day. And he's saying, you, you, you are the weapon. You are the protector of Israel. What are we going to do? You're it. You're our preservation, and you're. We're going to lose you. And what do we do? And now you can maybe understand what all of a sudden Elisha does for Yoash. Says Yoash, you got your bow. <coughs> And he opens the window to the east. Remember, east is this direction. Here's Samaria, and they got a window open that way. It says, get out your bow and draw it back. And here it is. 
Elisha said to him in response to that, take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. And he put his hand on it and draw it back. And Elisha lays his hands on this guy. He's got that thing drawn back like that. And he says, let that arrow fly. And he shoots this arrow out the east window. Isn't that weird? Verse 17 says, so open the window toward the east. And he opened it. And I said, shoot it. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, even the arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall defeat the Syrians at Aphek until you have destroyed them. Or it's probably Aphek. That's probably a better pronunciation. Best I can gather, Aphek is, it means fortress. And you'll see it used at several places around the nation. It's, and uh, most scholars believe that it is in the high country over here. It's a fortress probably one of the centers of power for the Syrians at that time, says you are going to take them. That arrow is symbolic of firing that arrow off to the east. You will defeat them there. Why do you think he put his hands on Do you think the king needed help stretching that thing out? What's the indication? What does it mean when that, that frail old man who's pretty much confined to bed, somehow manages to get up enough to get a hand on the bow and a shaky hand on that hand holding that arrow and say, let her go. What does he say? And the strength of Elisha go with you. Who's he represent? He's telling the king, you're going to do it, but it's not you shooting that arrow. The strength and the ability to defeat them is coming through God himself. And then he gives him a test. And this is the one that always seems so strange to me. He says, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. And he struck it three times and stopped. Huh? And in my English and in my brain, he grabs a fistful of arrows and goes back, back, back on the ground. And I found out I have no idea what that says. That's not what it said. What it means, and the intent is, when you strike the ground with the arrow, the terminology there, he's saying, you take that quiver of arrows and you just fire those puppies out there into the ground. So he's shooting them out the window into the ground, I guess. He says, you strike the ground with those arrows, and the command to him, or the directions to him, he says, take the arrows. In other words, everything in your quiver, pull them out, and shoot them. And he took three of them and shot them and then went, okay, now what? And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. In other words, all of the arrows, not just three of the arrows. He says, if you had done that, you would have struck Syria until you would have destroyed it. But now you shall strike Syria only three times. Why? Why? What does God expect of this king? He wants him to rely on him and? Does he want... Eh, three arrows, that's good enough. That ought to do it. Same thing we got. Always asks, asks of us if he tells us something, he wants us to obey, he wants us to follow through, he wants us to be looking to him for a direction. Offer yourselves a living sacrifice holy to him. He says, I don't want two, three arrows. I've promised you victory. But you're going to have to fight. And the test is, are you going to do it with everything you got? Or are you going to go, two, three arrows? Okay, is that good? How much do you need? You need it all? You need a little time? I'll give you whatever I can spare. Or however much I have ambition for. And it's like this king thought, oh, I shot two or three. What more do you want? He said, no, you just keep pulling them out. And don't stop until I tell you to stop or until you're out of arrows. 
and he didn't get it. And he says, well, I will stand good with the promise. God will stand behind you, and we'll see this actually comes out. He wins three decisive battles against the Syrians, and it does make a difference for them, but it ends there. And it's amazing to see this play out just exactly as Elisha had said. But a huge test for this king, will you, if you're coming to God, if you recognize that this is who you say he is, the savior of the nation of Israel, will you then listen to him? Will you follow what he said? We like it the way we like it, yeah. Looks like we are about out of time. You with that weird guess. <laughs> That's okay, we're about done anyway. We need to stop. We almost made it to the end. There's a few more interesting things that take place. Elisha dies after this and they'll bury him. And this will almost be the last we see of Elisha. One last little vignette. But um, the nation of Israel in such chaos, and here's the grace of God, the grace of God to each of these kings. Evil king says right in the front, God's grace reaches out to them, and he reaches out to us. But it's interesting what he's asking for. He says, I want your life. I want all of you. I don't want just a couple of shots and quit. I want the whole thing. And the same, as you've all said, is true of us today, that he wants everything. Father, uh, we thank you for our time together this morning for this piece of scripture that frustrates and puzzles us in many ways as we try to grasp the span of 30 some years here uh, all thrown at us at once and try to understand uh, what you're trying to teach us. Father, we're amazed at the grace that you extend to these folks so that then when we look at ourselves and realize uh, the sinful nature that we carry with us, uh, we have to be amazed at the grace that's been extended to us as well. And Father, even though uh, in our human weakness we uh, sometimes recognize and turn to you and, and receive that grace, so often we're just like these kings who uh, are half-hearted or are quickly distracted back into our same old way of living and adopting the world around us. Father, help us to uh, keep our focus on you. May we listen to the prophets that you send us. And may we, Father, uh, glorify you and shine the light of our lives on your grace and on your mercy for us. Just thank you for our time together this morning. In Jesus' name. How you doing, man? I gotta go find the other. Yeah, I'm just gonna go.